Remote Access VPN components. Looking at Remote Access VPNs, we essentially have on the head end to the right either the Cisco ASA firewall or the next generation firewall. Realize that for doing remote access VPNs, we can also use iOS routers, but we're focusing on firewalls for this discussion. Either the ASA or Firepower is capable of uh, supporting remote access VPNs. From the client side, we can either use the Cisco AnyConnect client or we can leverage the clientless connection. We'll talk about this in a bit more detail as we continue. Once the client leveraging AnyConnect or their browser is able to connect to the head end, the head end is going to require them to authenticate. Now, those credentials could either be stored locally. This is a quick, dirty way to set it up. This works great for a lab environment. It works great if you've got an ASA or Firepower appliance at the house. Uh, but for enterprise, for doing things a bit more scalably, we're probably going to want to incorporate a AAA server. So we'll tie our ASA or Firepower appliance into Active Directory or into Cisco's Identity Services Engine. This is where the authentication will occur against. So when the user connects, they'll give a username and password. A lot of times, ICE will touch Active Directory. Active Directory will return member information. Let's say that you're a member of accounting or a member of HR. ICE will make a policy decision based on your Active Directory group membership, just one of many ways to do it. Uh, that decision is going to be returned to your firewall, and then the firewall proceeds allowing or denying that connection to be established. So some of the important com components we just discussed, um, but looking at both full-time and clientless VPNs, realize that you're probably going to have a certificate involved. We want to have a certificate because authentication is occurring. On one side of the connection, You've got the user. How does the user authenticate? A lot of times, this ties into Active, credit, uh, active Directory credentials, as well as some other factor. If you require two-factor authentication, let's say for PCI, digital certificates are actually supported. So you can use a digital certificate as an alternative to a typical like key fob or something that's generating a pin every 30 or 60 seconds. Uh, there's got to be something that you know which is your password, and there's got to be something that you have, which can actually be intangible. It can be a digital asset, such as a digital certificate. Um, again, we can leverage either of these for authentication. If you're using digital certificates, one of the necessary components to think about is a certificate authority. While you can implement a CA server on Microsoft in a heartbeat, it's very easy, just roll it out as a server role, or we can go into uh, a Linux system with OpenSSL and set ourselves up as a certificate authority, are the users going to be enrolled with that CA server for remote access? If the case is yes, fantastic, you have no worries. But if you can't always guarantee that, you'll need to use a public CA server. So what you do there is go to our firewall. We would go to the outside interface, which of course has an IP address, but it probably also has a fully qualified domain name. Maybe it's something like remote access, .cisco.com or vpn.cisco.com or webvpn.yourdomain.com, whatever it might be, it's going to point to the outside interface. So the whole process of generating a certificate signing request, sending it to the CA server, that's where we take our public key, associate it with the fully qualified domain name. We say this public key goes with vpn.mydomain.com. The CA server administrator validates that information, and if true, issues you a certificate. Now, the good thing about this being a trusted third party is if you've got a user at some remote location anywhere in the world, they buy a brand new laptop because theirs was lost or stolen, they've got a critical meeting, a critical project they've got to get into, they can go ahead, take a brand new device, connect to the corporate VPN, and a digital certificate is going to be pushed to them from VeriSign, from Entrust, from Thought, from a trusted third party that says this really is who you think it is. And we go, fantastic. We've achieved authentication, <laughs> and only half of it. But we've authenticated the server side. We know that that's really our VPN server. Now, it's the client's requirement to do authentication. A lot of times, you'll, you'll almost always have a certificate on the server side. And then it's the client side where you've really got that option between using uh, usernames and passwords, tying an Active Directory, or even the user, uh, local user database, as they show here. We can just create user accounts within the configuration. It's quick and dirty, but it's not very scalable. 
What tends to be much better is using an external AAA server. So a lot of times this is what we'll do for our users and then for our devices, we'll use a digital certificate. Now, if you wanna go a bit further than that, we can issue certificates to each of our users, but it's a bit more overhead for the administrator. Uh, looking at a full tunnel VPN, this is what I would prefer to have as a technical user. It means any application on any port number, so long as it's not restricted by an ACL, is gonna be permitted, all IP traffic. An alternative to this is called clientless VPN. Now this is built for convenience. You can simply use your web browser, type vpn.yourdomain.com, perhaps, into that browser. It's gonna take you to the outside interface of your firewall. You'll authenticate and then you'll access resources behind the firewall. HTTP, FTP, uh, Common Internet File System, or CIFS, which we use for things like Windows file shares, works really well. Things outside of that list, which is everything else, requires application plugins, which can be buggy and can have, um, it can be broken by, these typically depend on Java. A Java update can be pushed from Sun it, or, or Oracle. It'll wind up breaking Java. It'll break our plugins for all of our users. And then when you want to fix it, well, the fix may not be around for three months, six months, and you can't run an insecure version of Java just to make this work. So it can really put you in a dilemma. Uh, a better alternative to those plugins is called Smart Tunnels. Uh, works really well in Windows, and it basically just hooks into some DLLs to take the I.O. from an application and redirect it through your SSL VPN. This is really slick when it works, but again, we've got remote users. We want to be able to support you know, perhaps Windows 7, Windows 8, Windows 10. Do you have OS X? Do you worry about Linux? Um, you're going to start to hit a lot of limitations. Does that device have endpoint protection? It may totally freak out if the web browser is pushing down you know, specific agents and trying to manipulate the routing table. So this is really slick when it works. It tends to work great for things like HTTP and FTP. Um, beyond that, your mileage may vary. Uh, for best compatibility in terms of lots of applications all working perfectly, a full tunnel VPN. And that just requires the AnyConnect Secure Mobility Client, which works in Windows, Linux, and OS X. Here's a nice table that lists some of the differences between the ASA as well as Firepower. Firepower, unfortunately, has been lagging behind a bit in IPsec support. There was a quite a, a lengthy window of time where if you wanted to have the latest, greatest firewall features, you ran Firepower. And if you wanted to have the best remote access VPN features, well, you ran classic ASA code. And if you wanted to have both at the same time, and redundancy, you might be running four ASAs. One pair just for VPN services, another pair for firewall services. And that's because all the services, all the things we can do exist on ASA. And then a subset of those tend to work on Firepower. Now, as time goes on, you're going to see more and more features natively built into Firepower. But we're at a point, at least in, during this recording, where the Firepower is still kind of catching up to some of the VPN capabilities of the ASA. And when we look at the underlying architecture of Firepower, you'll see that it really is a mixture of Firepower handling upper layer services and then traditional ASA code handling the lower uh, level services. Once a uh, long ago, these were fragmented, and now it tends to be unified. So both of these are kind of working uh, in the same capability. That said, the, the way that they've combined it in this unified code base, it's still a touch behind on some of the features. And just as a pop quiz, when we look at the different components, hardware components that are available, which of them would be best for a site-to-site -site VPN? Right? We're talking about remote access now. Remote access, the firewall is king of VPN, specifically the ASA. Firepower is getting there. When we look at the router, the router is king of site to site because he's got so many capabilities. He's got lots of different QoS models he can leverage. He's got uh, full uh, support for BGP, full support for complex multicast. Um, the firewalls can do a little bit of multicast, but not a lot of the fancy stuff. So which one is the perfect solution? in a lot of environments, both, because we'll have, if it's a decent size environment, a good mix of site-to-site -site connectivity, a lot of routing going on, maybe we've got uh, advanced QoS needs or MPLS that we've leveraged, 
And we also have a good number of remote access VPN users. So there's a good chance you could have both site to site and firewall doing VPNs. You look at that and you go, well, wait, am I going to use traditional ASA or am I going to use firepower? I've seen a lot of customers up until, and this is January 2020 that we're recording this, I see customers that are still running both. Um, they've got certain needs that the ASA handles really well, and they've got some newer boxes, maybe firepower appliances, that are doing traffic inspection only. Um, so really it's just a matter of whatever fits your organization's needs the best.